Chapter One, Wind and Bread. I'm going to remember this day for the rest of my life, I thought to myself. This was the day that I could no longer remember the gentle caress of the Sousa winds when I closed my eyes. Instead, as I blinked back the tears, all I could feel was the oppressive heat of the tunnel that I was trapped in and the bite of the unyielding rocks. And Dagon's latest gift to me. My lip curled in disgust and hatred at the thick mark of the brand on my upper right forearm. The three others before it had faded from an ugly red to a darker brown. They had stopped hurting, sorta. Four branding marks for four failed attempts at escape from my prison beneath the world. There was space for just one more at the very top of my arm. But that would also be my last, wouldn't it? Dagon Marr was the chief, as he liked to call himself, which was just a fancy term for slave master. All of the others here called him much more colorful names behind his back. I didn't even think that Tozat, which was Daza for horse dung, was a good enough term for him. He wasn't a tall man, but he was wiry and strong, fair-skinned like the rest of those Middle Kingdomers, and he seemed to like inflicting punishments on all of us tribespeople brought here to the mines of Masaka. And what for? I bit my bottom lip to stop myself from screaming in rage. Sometimes the overseers and the chief waved papers and said things like bonds or crimes, although I never committed any crime or signed any bit of Torvald paper. I had been twelve when I had been brought here, old enough to remember my mother, Yala, her rough sense of humor that hid a gentle heart. I wish I could hear you make jokes about the old men of the tribe again, I thought with a sudden hunger. She was the Imanu, or wise woman of the Suda tribe, which meant the Daza of the Western Winds. I was old enough to come here remembering the plains, the smell of the grasses, the caress of the Susa winds, bright colored bolts of cloth rippling in an endless sky. But all of those memories were starting to fade, weren't they? I tried not to cry as I sat in the dark. The colors weren't as bright in my mind as they used to be, and the scents of the grassland flowers not so strong. And now, I couldn't even remember the Sousa winds anymore. I wondered how long it would take me to forget everything else that came before this place as well. Narissia, my name went down the line, passed from one Daza mouth to the next, each of us was spread out along the narrow tunnel that was barely taller than we could crouch, and each of us were working at the holes we had painstakingly driven into the hard rocks. Nari. My name changed, becoming smaller as it came out of the lips of my neighbor. That was broad-shouldered Olir of the Metchoda tribe, the Daza of the open places. He was a few years older than me, and had been taken when he had been older, perhaps 15. We didn't get much time to talk, given the back-breaking work, but he sometimes told me stories of the plains. They call them the empty plains, but they were never empty, were they? He would chuckle. I've seen horses, deer, gazelle, wild lion, condors. I even saw a flight of dragons heading westwards once, he had been trying to cheer me up, I think. I told him he was making it up. Dragons were rare. Nari, the overseer wants you, O'Lear was saying, and in the flickering light of the stub of our tallow candles, I could see his grimace. What does that fat old toad want? I muttered back. I was in a foul mood today. Hardly surprising, given that my hands were raw from trying to hack and prod at the rock in front of me with my iron bar, and my arm was still oozing and sore. It's only the overseer, O'Lear offered gently. For all his size, he had a soft voice. At least it's not Dagon. 
suppose that. The next Dazza slave up from Olea spat just at hearing our chief's name. That would be Rebecca, smaller than me. She had a scar running from her temple to her jaw from when West Tunnel 2 had collapsed. She was one of the Dazza who had been here the longest and was well into her twenties. Or count. This time I could hear the guttural bark of the overseer from somewhere beyond me in the dark. I never bothered to learn his name, if he had ever shared it with any of us. Or count for Nerissia. Oh, great, I muttered as Olear shared a sympathetic look. What's that, third time today? They were picking on me, of course. Their next favorite pastime after branding me. It's because you tried to escape this moon just gone, Rebecca called down the line. You get a brand and an ore count, and we all get half rations. She was like that. She didn't mean to be nasty, but being down here for so long must have done something to her heart. I can't let myself end up like her, I promised myself. I have to remember the Sousa wind on my face. If I could just hold on to one memory, just one, then I might be all right. I might be able to keep my heart beating in my chest. Narissia, get out and get up here, the overseer bellowed down our small tunnel, and his words echoed and repeated, get out, get out, get out. I'm coming, I shouted, then quieter. Tell him I'm coming, will you, I told O'Lear who passed on my message as I gave one last crack with my iron bar, slid it out of the hole, and shoved my arm in its place. My carry basket beside me was woefully light. The scene we were working on was tough as it was, and with all of these ore counts I'd already had this shift, I'd barely managed to make any headway. But there, at the end, was a chunk of rock that was loose in my hand, Aha, uh -huh. it wouldn't be much, but it would help avoid any further troubles. I yanked my arm backwards for it not to move at all. Oh, come on, I hissed. I was stuck, my arm pinned down in the hole, wedged between the teeth of the protruding rocks. I pulled again, but my arm only gave a little, and I hissed as my skin scraped. Nari, what are you doing? O'Lear turned back to face me and then saw the predicament I was in. Oh, wait. He shuffled forward to my spot, reaching out to grab a hold of my branded arm. No, I don't want to break my arm, thank you very much. I snarled in pain and saw O'Lear's face look as though I had just slapped it. I was going to have to apologize to him for that. I berated myself. Nerissia, are you disobeying me? The words of the overseer barked and echoed down the tunnel towards me. Disobey, disobey, disobey. I heard a snicker from Rebecca, which only made me feel worse. I can do it, just everyone give me a moment, I said, wedging my cloth-bound foot against the wall and pulling. Ugh! It felt like my shoulder was going to pop out of its socket, but I was rewarded with a schloop as my arm scraped backwards before getting caught again. Only this time, it was my fist that was causing the blockage, hanging on to that big bit of ore. Nari, O'Lear said in alarm. I had a choice. It would take too long to try and break it down with my iron bar, so I had to get it out by hand. But with the overseer shouting, I had to either drop the rock and leave it, or try and break my fingers to get it out of the hole. Drat, it was no choice, really. Even if I broke my fingers, the overseer and Dagon Marr would still expect me to work. That was the kind of people they were, after all. And they would probably give me extra shifts or dock my food rations just for having the temerity to get injured. Fine, whatever. I grumbled, dropping the oar and removing my shaking and battered arm back to grab my carry basket with its tiny number of rocks sitting at the bottom. O'Lear must have seen my look of misery. As he quickly dipped into his own woven carry basket, 
and deposited a heavy lump into the bottom of mine. Here, just don't tell anyone, he said, not waiting for my thanks, as he turned back to the rock face and resumed work. Thanks, I muttered anyway, as I clambered and squeezed past the line of my fellow prisoners, back towards the waiting ire of the overseer. When I got back, I would have to give him the rock I'd left behind and hope it would repay his kindness. Hmm, the overseer said. He was a large, older man, easily twice my size in every direction, with a balding head and a thick set of leather and glass goggles over his eyes. We stood in one of the main avenues that speared down through the mines of Masaka, where it was wide enough to stand up straight and walk three or four abreast. I relished the moment of luxury as I stretched out my fingers and arms. Not bad, I suppose, he had to mutter as he hefted my haul in one hand. But not any good either. He ended with a snap as he dumped my woven and frayed basket onto the cart next to several others, before pulling on the rope that extended from the iron ring of the cart up the passageway. There was an answering jangle of a distant bell, and the cart slowly started to creak forward on wooden wheels. There was a treadmill up there, where a couple of my fellow tribespeople would be endlessly walking as they pulled or lowered the carts up and down the length of this place. And why all this effort? It was for a woman called Inyin, we had been told, although I had never met her, nor known any slave who had. No one except Dagon Mar, if he was to be believed. He said Inyin owned this patch of highlands, although I didn't understand how anyone could own a mountain at all. That was as absurd as saying that you owned the air you breathed. Whatever. This woman, Inyin, wanted iron brought up and out of her mountain, and so here I was. But that wasn't all that she wanted. You're to go up. The overseer jerked a callous thumb after the cart. Special orders from the chief himself. What? I said, appalled. Every one of us knew precisely what going up the mountain meant. It was possibly the most dangerous work that any of us could do. But our shift must be ending soon. By the time I get up there, I started to protest. I could see a few meters away the large collection of cylinders that made up the work clock. It had something to do with bags of sand and ticking rings of metal, but I didn't understand it. Anyway, I could clearly see under the light of the oil lamps that the large bronze pointer hand was definitely not far off a full circle. That meant that the bell would ring and the shift would change over. It's not ending for you, though, is it? The overseer croaked with an almost laugh. Special orders, I said. Now go on, git. He aimed a smack for the top of my head, but even in my exhausted state, I was too quick for him, and I jumped back. I didn't even bat an eyelid at his attempt to hit me. This was just another daily occurrence for those of us unlucky enough to find ourselves down here. But what if I collapse up there without any dinner? I called to him as I backed away. It was true. I would miss my next scheduled meal. For goodness sake, the overseer growled, but he plucked a skin of fresh water from one of the stationary carts and threw it at me, then tore a chunk off the round of bread and lobbed it at my face. I managed to duck that one, too, and when I recovered the dusty bit of loaf, I realized that he had given me the bit that was dusted with white and green mold. Wow, Thank you so much, Toad, I muttered under my breath. What did you say to me, you little? The overseer shouted. Gotta go, sir, special orders, I called back and jogged up the tunnel after the creaking cart before he could decide to throw any bits of rock at me this time.